Good evening, everyone. Really delighted to see um, so many of you here tonight for this um, event, which is part of our uh, Jewish resistance to the Holocaust series at the Wiener Holocaust Library. Um, and I'm really delighted that Dr. Ludovin Brock will be um, speaking to us tonight. Um, I'm Barbara Warnock. I'm the um, curator of the exhibition at the Wiener Library on Jewish resistance to the Holocaust. And just to say that we've got some tickets once again available to that. So if you'd like to see the exhibition, you can find out further details um, via our website. And um, tickets need to be pre-booked, but they're free. So there is once again an opportunity to see the exhibition, which closes on the 13th of January. So just to tell you um, about a couple of upcoming events that you might be interested, interested in, our final event in the Jewish Resistance event series is uh, Wolf Gruner speaking on individual Jewish resistance in Nazi Germany on 12th of January. And then we have got another event coming up on 26th of January, which is looking at um, some new works on British um, colonial violence. So you might be interested in those online events. And again, you can find out more on our website. So just a couple of technical points. Um, um, Ludovine is going to give her talk and then there'll be plenty of time for questions. So if you could put any questions that you've got for her in the chat function, everybody is muted. So put any questions in the chat and then I'll be um, posing those questions to her. Um, the event is captioned if you would like to use the caption. So you can see there's a closed caption option at the bottom so you can activate that. Um, there will be a presentation, so just to remind you that if, if you prefer, you could actually select um, to um, view the speaker rather than the presentation as the kind of large screen if you prefer to watch the event in that way. So as I say, I'm really delighted um, that Dr. Ludovine Brock agreed to speak to us tonight on um, the subject of the resistance in colour. Um, this event is for the Jewish Resistance Exhibition, but the great thing about having exhibition events is that you can expand on the themes in the exhibition. And so here, um, Ludovine will be looking at another lesser known example of resistance, um, that is the um, resistance of French colonial subjects during the Second World War. Um, so, just to introduce uh, Ludovine, so Dr. Ludovine Brock is a senior lecturer at the University of Westminster. She researches society and culture, both within and beyond Europe, around the time of the Second World War. Brock is interested in people's lives during this period's period, their thoughts, feelings, and the objects that surround them. She is also interested in how this translates, or not, into memory and commemoration throughout the post-war decades and to this day. She has written extensively on the history and memory of the French resistance and the Holocaust, not least through the prism of railway workers and colonial resistors. And on the subject of railway workers, she is the author of Ordinary Workers, Vichy and the Holocaust, French Railwomen and the Second World War. Brock is currently working on a story of gratitude objects and cultural diplomacy in the immediate post-war funded by the British Academy and Leverhulme. So without further ado, I'll hand over now um, and be hearing from some of you with questions at the end. So Ludovine. Thank you so much, Barbara, uh, for inviting me here today. I'm gonna try and uh, share my screen, perhaps, uh, before I start talking so that I get that little technical part out of the way. Um, can everybody see my screen or can Barbara, can you see my screen full? Yeah, great. Fantastic. So yes, thank you so much for um, inviting me here today. I'm really, really honored. Um, I was invited, like you said, in light of the exhibition on Jewish resistance in the Holocaust that you currently have on. And unfortunately, I am one of the people who had a ticket um, during the lockdown period. <laughs> So I, uh, I will have to uh, reorganize my visit. 
but I got I caught snippets of the exhibition through not least your YouTube channel and some of the short films you have on it. And I feel it does so well to talk about the varieties of resistance and resistors in this period. And this is really what I'm going to be talking about today. I'm kind of pushing that further from the well-known acts of uh, a, you know, kind of armed resistance of ghetto uprising to lesser known, more quiet acts such as you know, the partisans in Soviet territories or bearing witness by writing diaries in extraordinarily difficult circumstances. And, and this evening, I want to kind of continue to stretch out these ideas, not only of what forms resistance took, but especially in the case of my talk of who took part in these acts of resistance. Because the image of the Second World War resistor is very often male, but it is also very often white. Um, and the exhibition already seriously challenges this image of the resistor, has some incredible photographs of these Jewish and female resistors, um, some of them in action, and they're truly, truly wonderful to see. And I want to follow in that direction, therefore, um, tonight, but take you to occupied France. And here I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the non-white or rather colonial resistors in the Second World War. Now this goes against the grain of what we tend to know about the French resistance. And some of you will be familiar with the history of the French resistance, but I thought I'd outline briefly um, parts of it here, not least because I think by remembering certain parts of it, we can really understand and remember how important it is to push the boundaries of a widely accepted and still dominant image of, of what resistance looked like in the war. So the Nazis invaded France in May, 1940. And after a few weeks, the French army came under incredible pressure to the point that the French signed an armistice to collaborate with the Germans. Now this was the beginning of the Nazi occupation. It began in late June, 1940, and it would last until late August, 1944, when Paris, the capital was liberated. The stories of uh, French resistance often start with one man. And this is General Charles de Gaulle, who is pictured here on the left. So we heard Philippe Pétain declare that the French would end the fighting and collaborate with Germany on 17 June 1940. And a few people the following day heard a speech on the radio by uh, the French general, very little, very unknown at this point, Charles, uh, Charles de Gaulle. And France was still alive, he was saying. It would fight on from beyond the French main borders, from the mainland. De Gaulle would lead the free French forces outside of mainland France for four years, organizing, leading them, and working closely with the Allies to plan their return to North Africa and Europe and France and to expel the Germans. Now this was the major form of French resistance beyond the hexagon, beyond the mainland. And when Charles de Gaulle gave his speech a few years later in Paris on the 25th of August, just when the city was liberated, he was very careful to place the role of those resistors within France, in the mainland, at the heart of the liberation of the capital. And you may know these very famous lines, Paris outraged, Paris broken, Paris martyred, but Paris liberated. Liberated by itself, liberated by its people, and with the help of the French armies, with the support and the help of all of France, of the France that fights, of the only France, of the real France, of the eternal France. And thus opens a French resistance myth. The French resistance groups and networks within the mainland was what he was referring to, as well as all of the individual acts of resistance across the country. He provided this wonderful uh, umbrella under which so many actions could, could find, a, find a place. This was part of a myth of French resistance that the French had resisted the Nazis uniformly since day one and had liberated themselves. Like all myths, though, it has a kernel of truth to it. There was resistance in the mainland although it was much more fragmented and complex than the myth allowed. And indeed, only very few people dared resist in the autumn of 1940. It was very rare at this point. It does escalate though, and it changes shape and it grows in number over the years of the occupation, such that by 
in the summer of 1944, resistance was much more widespread. Resistance, of course, meant a lot of different things from cultural to armed resistance. There were many different ways that you could protest the Nazi occupation. And there were also many groups from the communist, the socialist, to the gaullist, and they did not always get along. There was innumerable tensions. Jean Moulin, who's the man portrayed on the right, would lead the MUR, the Mouvement Uni de la Résistance, the United Movement of the Resistance, in order to unite these different groups and to liaise with de Gaulle and to kind of bridge this gap between the internal and the external resistance. And Moulin became the second major symbol of resistance in these immediate post-war years and decades. It is perhaps not so surprising that two white men were the first main symbols of the French resistance because skin color did matter for the resistors, not least for the free French. Now, although the free French army was made up of mostly African and Arab soldiers, publications at the time which were showing the free French and were being published were showing mostly exclusively white men, almost some of the tracks and pamphlets I'm finding, like you see on the left, the Force Française Libre, 90% of the photographs are, of, are white fighters. The African and Arab soldiers are very rare in these images. And when they do appear, they're highly exoticized in both image and in text. Then in August, 1944, when the allies were in deep discussion about who was to enter Paris to liberate it, the Deuxième Division Blindé, the second armed division, was chosen precisely because it was, first of all, French. It was neither British nor American. It was very important to have French people enter the capital. And also because the French, it was the French division with the fewest colonial soldiers. It had about 25% colonial soldiers, when most divisions had a minimum of 40%. And for the British, and I quote, anything other than white French metropolitan troops entering Paris would be accepted with reluctance. Now, this was not necessarily the case for the liberation of Southern France, where they welcomed the idea of African and Arab soldiers liberating these territories. But the liberation of Paris, which to this day we conflate with the liberation of the entire French nation was highly symbolic and therefore required a different image of, relation, of, of liberation and specifically a white one. But the image of the white male resi a French resistor has been challenged by historians. Since the 1980s, historians have increasingly shown the diversity of resistors in regards to political affiliations, religion, nationality, gender, and social class. Books by Annette Vivorka or Robert Gilday show the widespread roles and sacrifices of Jewish resistors, of foreign resistors, of female resistors. And recently, the Canadian historian Eric Jennings reorientated the heart of the French resistance entirely. We usually see that, think that the French resistance was born in Paris or in London. He argues, though, that it was born in Africa where the first voices were heard resisting the Franco-German armistice in June 1940. And I quote from Jennings' book, the archetypal early French resistance fighter between 1940 and 1943 was in fact black. Now Jennings is referring here mostly to those resistance fighters beyond the French mainland, beyond the hexagon. Books about the resistance within France have remained very much, even though they have shown like I said, much more diversity in religion, politics, gender, and, and nationality, there still remains very little mention of resistance fighters who had come from the colonies. Now, this is particularly surprising, as about 200,000 colonial soldiers, laborers, students from the colonies were in France when the Nazis invaded. So what had happened to them? Had they simply not resisted? or have they been sidelined or forgotten from history to some extent? So it's their story, their stories that I am interested in. I have selected four colonial resistors to follow in this talk this evening. Um, all of them are from different parts of France's overseas empire and territories. Pierre Azafi, André Mango, Mohamed Lagdartoumi, Moussa Abadi, and Adiba. Their stories show that 
colonial resistors were involved in the French internal resistance from the very beginning of the occupation in a number of ways. We understand how and why they got involved in the resistance networks, but we will also interestingly see the overlap, for instance, between colonial resistance and Jewish resistance and rescue. Indeed, the image of the colonial resistors is in no way uniform and captures multiple identities, ethnicities, religions, further reminding us of the huge variety of people living under French rule, both within and beyond the hexagon who risked their lives to resist the Nazis, Vichy and the Holocaust in the Second World War. Now I will begin in June 1940. After a swift invasion, the Germans had defeated the French army in a matter of weeks and signed an armistice. This ensured the collaboration of France and the occupation of the majority of the territory. The demarcation line that you can see here on this map on the left separated the occupied from the free zone until November 1942, after which point the whole territory becomes occupied until um, the liberation. One of the problems that immediately arose after the signing of the armistice was that of the colonial prisoners of war. Colonial soldiers were specific targets of Nazi racial persecution during this time, and they faced a much higher risk of death than other POWs precisely because of their skin color. One of the very first acts which emerges in France was linked to their rescue. As a few people began their clandestine work in the summer of 1940, setting up escape networks for colonial prisoners of war to cross the demarcation line and to end up in the much safer territory of the free zone. I'm speaking specifically of Germain Sion, who's photographed here on the right. She was an ethnographer specializing in Algeria and became one of the most well-known resistors of the Musée de l'Homme resistance group. With Captain Paul Huet, they founded the Union Nationale des Combattants Coloniaux, the UNCC, the National Union of Colonial Fighters, in the summer of 1942. And their sole aim was to help colonial prisoners of war through a number of ways, some legal, some not. One of the things that they did was to help these men escape to the South. But in order for them to establish vast escape network, networks, which had to cover the entire territory, they needed to collaborate with others and other groups, specifically with charitable organizations and associations who were already in place and could use their contacts and resources to help those in flight. And so enters Pierre Asafi Adrimongo. Originally from Madagascar, Pierre was 26 at the time. He was a student, he was living in Paris and studying at the famous art school, the Beaux-Arts. He was leading a community center, the Amical des Malgaches, the, um, for, for uh, people from uh, Malgache, uh, Malgache, when in October 1940, he was contacted by Germaine Sillon and her close colleagues, and he was invited to expand his work into supporting colonial POWs through, again, a number of different kinds of activities, some were about transferring care and packages um, and letters or organizing. Um, a lot of uh, colonial POWs had marraine, these kind of godmothers who came to visit them in the, in the camps and to provide a kind of support network since they had no family on the mainland. Um, but very quickly, his involvement slips into organizing and supporting their illegal escapes. They provided, he and his, actually his, his wife, who's pictured here, provided housing for escapees. They provided food, civilian clothing, false papers, and ended up probably providing support for all of the Malgache prisoners of war escaping via Paris. These men were smuggled into the Southern Free Zone before their transport to their country of origin was organized or tried to be organized. His wife, Suzanne, who he marries in 1942, was also from Madagascar and worked. they worked together. Similarly to Razafi Adrimangu, Mohamed Taleb, an Algerian veteran of the First World War, was directing a community center in Southwest France. He supplied the UNCC network with crucial materials to help smuggle colonial POWs across the demarcation line near Bordeaux. And so from the very beginning, we see that 
people who are originally from the French colonies, but who are residing in occupied France are part of some of the most famous and most central. I mean, Jean-Mathieu is one of the, the most famous resistors in France. And they are part of these movements, providing resources and connections all over the country in order to help colonial POWs escape. The second resistor I'd like to introduce you to is the Algerian Mohamed Lagdartoumi. I encountered Lagdartoumi in the police archives in Paris, where the special brigades one and two, who were in charge of arresting um, and suppressing communist, gaullist, and other terrorist groups, um, have all of their nominative files for the period of occupation are held in the uh, police archives of the Paris prefecture. And within these, I identified dozens of cases involving North African men and women linked to communist resistance networks and activities. The resistance took on many forms. Some were points of contacts and mediators, some created and spread communist pr propaganda, and some were involved in sabotage and ass assassination plans. The police interrogation files are fascinating, if tragic, to read. And many of the people who I mentioned today, but also the others that I found, were executed or deported to Mauthausen and Buchenwald, amongst other um, camps. Mohamed Lagdartoumi was born in 1914 in Algeria. He had come to France in the late 1930s and he got married. He had two children. And I cross his path in the archives when he gets arrested in January 43 for his role in the FTP, the Front Tireur Partisan that you see here, a poster on the right, was a major resistance organization well known to the special brigades for its communist roots and its violent acts of resistance, or according to them, terrorism. Indeed, the FTP was started in late 1941 by the French Communist Party, the PCF. They resisted in various ways, not least clandestine press, and intelligence services. Crucially though, they were specializing in active violent resistance, which is still remains very rare for most of the occupation and very dangerous. They had started in the occupied zone, but spread out to include, excuse me, I've lost my, to include the whole territory. And they held one of the most important resistance wings in France, the FTP MOI, the Main d'Oeuvre Immigrée, which contained foreign and uh, as well as many Jewish resistors. Leg Dertoumi had first become involved with the Communist Party in his 20s in Algeria, when he was a member of the Jeunesse Communiste d'Alger. He moved to France in 36 and a few years later, war erupts and France becomes occupied. After he was arrested, he was actually arrested along with his, his lover with who he was living at, at the time. And they were both interrogated in the Fresnes prison um, and tortured there. In his files, we find out that he had kind of his links with the PCF start in 4041, when a colleague urges him to get more involved in the PCF. And Lagdar Toumi seems to have begun his illicit activities around this time by spreading communist propaganda, especially um, uh, orally in cafes. But then he starts to make communist inscriptions on walls and sidewalks, which was already dangerous in itself, but this escalates into gathering and supplying information such as the location of German garages, um, which would become sabotage targets. He denies any direct links to physical attacks during the interrogation, but was unsurprisingly deported to the Natsvila Strutov concentration camp before going to Dachau. And Lagdartoumi survives the camps and he eventually returns to France and then to Algeria. Lagdar Toumi's involvement in the resistance was similar to that of many other colonial resistors I have found. They had strong ties to communist networks, generally pre-existing the war. The rupture of the Nazi-Soviet pact in 1941 following the invasion of the Soviet Union serves as a major trigger uh, for many of them to take part in the French resistance. And it's not that they weren't resisting or uh, up until that point, but that is a, remains a, the Communist Party is not comfortable with the Nazi Soviet pact, but that remains a major turning point. This was also the case, by the way, for Rafael Amiel. Amiel was born in Tunis in 1890 to Califat and Analevi and fought for France in the First World War. When the special brigades came to arrest him in 1941, 
he was unemployed and he lived here at 47 Rue de Turenne. Um, this is where he was arrested. It's a street in Paris in the heart of the Marais, the Jewish neighborhood of Paris. He was arrested with his partner, Charlotte Autessier, for being um, in breach of the anti-communist degree. And basically he was found in his apartment with 23 communist propaganda tracts. Now, Amiel declared he did not know where they had come from. They just appeared. Um, and he'd kept them more because he didn't know what to do with them rather than anything else. Now, the police, however, were deeply suspicious. He had actually been since June 1940 on their dangerous communist list. And he was deported to Mauthausen in March 1944 after a long period of internment. He was affected actually to a concentration camp nearby a few months later and died there um, on 1st of January 1945. Although it's never directly referred to um, in the paperwork, it is, it is possible that Rafael Amiel is Jewish. Um, this is not particularly surprising as there were important Jewish communities throughout the French empire, not least in North Africa. And in fact, there were other Jewish resistors amongst um, those who, I, uh, who I'm looking at who come from France's imperial territories. And this brings me to Moussa Abadi, who is a Syrian born Jew. And he had come to France from Damascus where he had been raised in a very humble and very uh, strictly religious family. He came to France in 1933. He came to study literature. He was writing a thesis on uh, medieval theater and was starting a career as, uh, as an actor at the time as well. Abadi, like others, had witnessed the intensification of Jewish persecution in France during the occupation. From Vichy's anti-Semitic laws, to the internment and deportations of Jews in the summer of 1942. Now in November of 1942, like I mentioned, the Nazis crossed the demarcation line and the Southern Free Zone now becomes subject to roundups and arrests for, the, for Jews directly from, from Germans as well as still the French police. With the help of the Catholic Bishop of Nice, Monseigneur René Raymond, Moussa Abadi and his partner, Odette Rosenstock, who is pictured here in the photograph with uh, Moussa. She was a Jewish doctor. She'd grown up in Paris, but from a very uh, uh, kind of a Parisian, typical liberal Parisian home um, and had very few links at the time in her upbringing to Jewish culture. And together they built a network called the uh, Réseau Marcel, the Marcel Network, to rescue Jewish children from deportation. The bishop gave Abadi an office, and it's from there that he and Odette would orchestrate a vast operation. Moussa established contacts with a variety of religious communities and began to build a network to save these Jewish children. He was 33, Odette was in her late 20s. Their operation involved hiding hundreds of children in schools and convents, maintaining contact with them, funding their stays, and of course, getting these children to cooperate and lead a secret life after the utter tragedy of having already been separated from their parents and possibly their entire families. Now, one of these institutions was the Catholic orphanage in Cannes, Le Rayon de Soleil, which had just been opened by Alban and Germain Faure in, um, in the late 1930s. It now became one of the many hiding places for Jewish children. And Odette uh, was arrested in April 1944. She is tortured, she is deported to Auschwitz and later to Bergen-Belsen. She survives the camps, returns to France and marries Moussa Abadi. In total, 527 Jewish children were saved thanks to the extraordinary actions that they took. André Poche-Carsentier, who wrote a book about them, was one of those children who had been hidden at the Rayon de Soleil. I think she is three years old when she enters the Rayon de Soleil. Um, and she survives the war and, and has been really important in bringing back their, their story to light. Um, her own parents and two brothers died in the Holocaust, as did most of her extended family. Now, there is a bit of literature on the Marcel network, um, as well as a documentary. This is uh, rare for most colonial resistors, but it's not completely unheard of. And there are a few stories which are becoming um, more well-known. In recent years, work has been done to tell some of these incredible stories like that of Adiba. Now, Adiba um, 
you can see there's a maybe the the top right image is uh it's called No Patriot. It's a film that was released in 2017, which is about Adiba, or actually, well, actually he doesn't play that central role, you could argue. But anyways, Adiba was born in Guinea in 1913, and he escaped captivity in 1940 um, with several other colonial soldiers. Now they live clandestine clandestinely and in terrible conditions for a while. Um, the others decide to leave to go to Switzerland, but Adiba decides to stay in France and to fight in the resistance. In March 1943, he was part of a small group that began a maquis in the Vosges region, also known as the Camp de la Délivrance, the Camp of Deliverance. Now the maquis are groups of generally young men, um, even teenagers, living illegally in the French countryside and mountains. They are armed and they are major threats to the Germans and were a constant target of um, very brutal repression. Adiba was arrested and he was tortured by the Germans in 1943 and he dies on 18 December of that year. His story that leads him to the Mekki is not that unique. Um, colonial prisoners of war or laborers joined the Mekki not least as it provided some kind of structure in a country which was otherwise very difficult, if not completely impossible um, to navigate and survive. Now, some Maki were particularly well known for including African and Arab POWs. Uh, this is the case of the Corps Franc de la Montagne Noire who are photographed and Adiba is here on the left, by the way, and at the bottom, right is Le Corps Franc de la Montagne Noire Maquis. And this was a very large Maquis of up, uh, uh, about 900 men. It included many from the colonies, not least Algerians, Moroccans, and apparently one man from Iraq. These include El Borni Ben Mohamed Ben Al Khalifi, who was from Tunisia, Tahar Mezian, who was Algerian, and Rabia Kimoun, also Algerian. According to one survivor, North Africans were generally handling the multiple barrel machine guns in this maquis. These young maquisards who I've just mentioned um, were all in their late 20s and early 30s at the time, and they were shot by Germans in July, August 1944, just before the liberation. Some of their names are commemorated on a monument in the Front Bruno Forest where they had lived for so long. I don't know how I'm doing for time. I have no sense of the time <laughs> anymore, but um, I think I have time for a brief conclusion. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. The stories of Pierre Azafi Adimangu, of Mohamed Lagdertoumi, of Moussa Abadi, of Adiba, and I think it's important to remember their names because I think it's, it's, it's really important to give these people, these men an identity which is more lasting than, than it has been so far in, in our history and memory of the French resistance. Their stories are not isolated cases. Hundreds of men and women from France's overseas territory fought not only in the Free French Army, as historians have shown, but also within the internal resistance. And I've already mentioned some of these names to you this evening in, in the talk, and it's actually incredibly hard to trace them, and I can Maybe, I don't know if, if someone's interested in, in asking about that, but that's something I can develop a little bit more about my, the methods I use to try and track um, these colonial resistors. But, but it's really important to tell their stories. As I've shown, the reasons for their resistance was very varied. Sometimes it was out of humanitarian urge, like Pierre Azafi Adimango or Moussa Abadi. Um, sometimes it was through communist links, such as Mohamed Lagdar uh, Toumi and Raphael Amiel, or sometimes it also fell into um, choosing a life, um, to a clandestine life and joining the Meki, like Adiba, in part for a desire to fight for the resistance, to fight for France or a certain idea of France, but perhaps also in part uh, because there's a lack of other viable options to lead a kind of a, 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 a safe, normal life for colonial men and women living in France at that time. Their stories stretch, stretch out our ideas and images of the resistance from the images of, du they're very different to the images of de Gaulle, of Jean Moulin, of the ones which are being published at the time 
of, of um, the Second World War and the following decades. Unfortunately, this, this paper th that, that my talk is based on only scratches the surface of much more work which needs to be done to recognize and commemorate their role in, in, the, in the war. But I do not, however, want to simply create new heroes of the resistance. That's not really the purpose of, of, what, I'm, of what I'm doing. The stories of the individuals, I think, show actually much more than that. They ask us new and different questions. They show very nuanced histories. They tell us a lot about the role, or not that much, about the role of women, but uh, perhaps of intimacy in relationships um, in the resistance. And that's something that I don't get into in in this talk, but I'm very interested and I found repeated in the archives of often these intimate relationships which are part of their life as, as resistors from the colonies. They also reveal much about the relationship between colonial resistors and France or why one might join the resistance. Legdertoumi, returning to Algeria, would later fight the French in the Algerian war and be imprisoned for some time the kind of ideas of the France that they're fighting for or the causes that they're fighting for are, are not as fixed as we imagine. The relationship between colonial subjects and citizens living in Vichy France and the French state, be it the state that Pétain represents in Vichy or the state that de Gaulle represents in London was not always straightforward. And actually there are many colonial resistors who don't join the resistance, uh, sorry, colonial soldiers or workers um, or students who don't join the resistance either. Um, and that is another part yet to, to I think, fully explore. Um, I want to kind of uh, end quickly by bringing it back to the exhibition of the idea of imagining different kinds of resistors and different reasons for resisting that are all pushing us towards, pushing them towards this, this crucial moment in history. Um, I found particularly interesting this overlap between uh, these colonial resistors and and Jewish resistance, and I think that's a possible further area of inquiry um, on on my part. Uh, but I will I I will end here. Well, thank you um, so much uh, for such a rich and fascinating um, talk. We've got quite a few questions that have come in. Um, a first quite straightforward one is just Hillary's asking um, how you spell. I think she she must be meaning Maquis. Oh yeah, it's um, M-A-Q-U-I-S. And she's also asking, what is a good definition of the hexagon? I, I say the uh, hexagon is mainland France and, and Corsica. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, I that would be my, it's mainland France. But to, I think crucially to, to when, I, when we talk about occupied France, it can be a bit confusing because one part is occupied, one part is not occupied, and then they, the whole territory becomes occupied. And I think that this idea of the mainland or l'exagon is, is a useful one um, to kind of think about these territorial, territorial boundaries. Okay, thank you. And we've got a couple of stories, with, um, questions, sorry, that um, relate to what you said about how perhaps you could tell us a bit more about um, your methodology. So Andrea's asked if you could tell us more about um, your research and Frederica would be interested in hearing more about your methodology and what sources um, you have used. So perhaps you could kind of address those points and expand on those areas a bit. Yeah, and I actually, I'm gonna go back quickly to the my key question because I feel I spelt it out and that was a bit, <laughs> you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is not very useful. I mean, this is a starting point, but if you're, you know, the Mekki, there's quite a lot, you know, that you can find out about it. But Rod Kedward is a historian who wrote a, lot, a book in search of the Mekki. He, it's a really beautiful book um, that he published about um, the stories of these Mekisars in Southern France. So if you are interested in learning more about the Mekki, I think that's a wonderful uh, place, to, place to start. Um, but yeah, so to focus now on the, methodologies. Um, basically, it's, there's no, there's no file, there's no file, no neat file that says colonial resistors. Um, and actually, I'm quite grateful for that, because it really pushes you as a researcher to kind of think of new and different ways of building your own methodology. Mine, my one of my first, um, one of the first things I did was scroll through lists. And there are 
a number of lists. Um, there are lists of um, deportees. There are lists of um, those who were arrested by the uh, special brigades. Those lists are in the archives in, in Paris. There are lists of those who have been acknowledged as uh, resistors by the French state. They're called homologués, so it means you're formally recognized as a resistor. Crucially, if you're only looking at these kinds of lists, the problem is that if is that so many names would will slip through the net because not everyone who resisted is homologué for a number of reasons, and depending on what we define by, by resistance, what we mean by resistance in the first place, not all of them were deported. And that even then, it's very hard to actually find them. It takes so long. I've scratched the surface of the military um, list. I've looked at, I think, three letters, uh, you know, because there's pages and pages and pages. And what you have to do, and this is what I did in the Paris art, in the police archives, is when I had, which has a smaller, more accessible list uh, from the special brigades, these nominative lists, is I looked through pages and pages of names. What names sound like they could be from North Africa? This is a terrible methodology full of problems. Um, but it's one of the only routes that we have as a starting point. There's then, where were they born? Often their place of birth is also included. So where were they born? And here again, you have new names which surface. And then you have to go into their files and they have files, some of their files are in the police archives, some of their files are in the military archives in Vincennes. Some of their files are in the Archive Nationale. They're extraordinarily scattered. But it's by going through those lists. And I've, this paper is based mostly on going through um, the, the special brigades lists. But then there's the other parts of internet research. The minute you find a name, you enter it into Google which is wonderful. I have found so many leads, so many ways to connect the dots between these people, finding certain of their archives in the CDJC, some of the archives in uh, Vincennes, some of the archives then in the Archive Nationale, the Germain Tillon, um, for instance, in the Musée de l'Homme uh, resistance papers of the NCC, this is where you're finding names of people who they worked with. You wouldn't, you don't see, find these names in the list of the brigades, um, uh, special brigades. And so it's it's this constant to and fro of cutting and pasting and guessing. And I think what really needs to be done, and also on memorials, because some of that would be another place to look on these, you know, on, on kind of uh, small uh, memorial sites, you know, what names are included, what names aren't. And, and you can piece together a list. I mean, I think this, crucially, I think this, um, this kind of work is, needs number of people on it and a number of funding. <laughs> it will take a long time. I, th I think there's a space, a big space for interest though. There are um, several really interesting studies that are being done about colonial soldiers, about um, colonial laborers um, and, and in France and also beyond. And I think that, you know, bringing these together is, an, you know, is the only way forward to kind of, um, so that was my methodology in a yeah. long roundabout way. Thank you. And I suppose to sort of um, carry on from that, um, just um, Dan Stone is wondering in terms, I suppose, of sources and things, did any of the people that you talk about leave behind um, any writings um, or did their groups publish any clandestine journals or articulate their plans for the post-war period? So I suppose it's a sort of two-part question. Yes, so some of them did. So um, uh, Pierre has a fait mango. I have not found that much, um, but I think that there is more, that more could be done. I mean, it has been that this, you know, this, uh, yeah, I think I think more could could be found there. I haven't found a journal or anything. Adiba, there are writings. There are people who worked with him because also he was very recognizable, and so he stuck out. So if you're looking for information about him, you might find it in in the in the in the kind of testimonies and and um, uh, journals and memoirs of the people who who encountered him. Um, and that is how they built this documentary. That is how 
Um, there's a couple books about him. That is how that kind of uh, st his story has been told. Uh, Mohamed Lagdartoumi, I have found nothing. And I think, I think there could be more. And I think it's such an incredible photograph. This photograph is from the, the, the police archives. Moussa Abadi, there's a lot that has been written about him. And he is actually, um, his whole network is now, the Rayon Soleil uh, home is now a Righteous Amongst the Nations. It was made Righteous Amongst the Nation in um, 1980, between 83 and 85. The founders of the Rayon Soleil are Righteous Amongst the Nations. The children of Moussa and Odette Abadi are the children, these are the 527 children who were saved, are now in an association which is led by Andre, who I mentioned. Um, and they have stories yeah. about, about them. Actually, Odette and Moussa also had writings um, of, of that period. There's then, um, actually, oh, this is funny. I, I just, this is, this is not staged, but actually, this book, which I think my son was trampling on earlier this afternoon, and I tried to save it from the floor by putting it next to next to my computer. These are the diaries of Henri Lemery, who was in the Vichy government, and um, uh, at uh, and who was a colonial minister from uh, in Vichy during at the beginning of the occupation. Then and he disappears and he reappears a bit after the war. He is a Pétainist. He's very good friends with Pétain, but he um, actually. His, he does not a kind of act of resistance in the very beginning of the uh, occupation when there is a, a sign, a big sign that is posted on the demarcation line at several, at several railway stations, several crossing points, which is that no Jews nor people of color are allowed to cross the demarcation line. This is one of, I think it's a really unique moment that's not very uh, much discussed, but then a number of of, of ministers from who and and kind of people in the government are elite part of the elite in France from from Martinique from Madagascar are outraged by this you know saying you can't you know you cannot discriminate against people of color they write a letter to Pétain in protest this is a kind of an act of uh, denunciation and protest but it it goes really no further but he he wrote um, these are his memoirs. And so you can find through a number of kind of, but aside from people who are quite well known, finding the stories of people like Lagdartoumi or Raphael Lamiel, it's very hard. And I just hope that, um, yeah, that's why I think you need uh, great resources to, to unlock these. Yes. And I, I suppose kind of related again to that, um, Rebecca Clifford is asking that uh, about the, of the people who survived, did they later speak publicly about their experiences? Not that I know. Absolutely not that I know. Um, and this is, you know, I think after after the war, one of the main problems for for many people is to go to go home and to go back to uh, to their countries of origin and to see their families again, because these are people who've been is completely isolated um, for, for so many years now. And at the time of collecting, you know, when collecting testimonies, collecting, um, uh, doing interviews, you know, when the first files of the resistance are being built, to, pulled together, I don't think these pe pe many of them are around to talk about their experience. And I haven't yet, um, unfortunately uh, found that. And I think the problem with France also is linked to it's what happens after the war with the colonies, which is for the case for like Dartoumi. You know, this is a France that they fight for uh, and they defend in the Second World War. But already during the time, they're seeing that this is not a France who is defending them or valuing them when, uh, you know, colonial soldiers are not, uh, are kind of start to be stripped away from, from the free French army as they advance across Europe to liberate the continent um, from Germans because of, of the race, the question of race. And this is not, this is not lost on them. And the disregard of the French nation and the desire to 
you know, move on with their lives away from France um, and is, is, is very strong. So I think this, this period is also really, is not straightforward. It's a little more problematic um, than for other resistors who come to talk about their experience after the war. Yes, um, and in that context, um, Chen um, has asked how widespread is, is knowledge of, of, of colonial resistors in France, you know, moving on till now, but I, from what you're saying, I suspect it's not great. It's not great. There was, I was talking to Robert Gilday about this, who, who published this book, uh, Fighters in the Shadow, which I, I, I showed at, at the beginning of my slide. And he was, uh, and now, I mean, I can't remember which museum it was. Um, he was in a, a resistance museum and there's a lot of resistance museums in France. Um, and they, he was talking about, you know, oh, do you have, what about people from the colonies? And they said, there's, there's, we know nothing about them. There's no information. I think they had one cap from a colonial POW in their display. And the idea, what was seemed frustrating was that there was seemed to be this general, well, we just don't know very much. There's not, there's no information. And so I think unless, and you know, and then you get these stories. I mean, one of the things with Adiba is it's wonderful that his story is being told, um, but it's not unproblematic because once the stories surface, it becomes a story of, of blind heroism and adulation of France and the film. And I'd be, I need to look into this more because I only saw the film recently, in fact, and I was struck by how Adiba is portrayed as somebody who adores France and fights for the, you know, liberté, égalité, fraternité. And I really think that that's almost the danger of, of some of these stories re resurfacing, which is so incredibly important. And, you know, these, but, but myths are still continuing somehow of this mm -hmm. idolized resistance. Um, and, and so if you take away, if you you're kind of having these anecdotal, not, not anecdotal, but these kind of, oh, well, he, this is one story and here's another story and just kind of tag along a few stories. What you get is you don't get a picture, a real understanding of the relationship between those who are from the colonies living in France and the resistance and the resistors. I think it's those wider patterns, um, yeah, that need to be, yes, unearthed. Yes, um, and another related question from Pristine Schmidt is to do with following up. You know, as we've been discussing, the the um, contributions and activities of um, these resistors have not figured more prom have not figured prominently in narratives of French resistance. But perhaps you could comment on why that is particularly with respect to rescue um, as a form of resistance? Yeah, no, that's that's a really great question. I think, um, and I, I must underline actually, you know, that, that Eric Jennings has worked so much on the free French um, in, in Africa and that, you know, this is, I'm really talking about the internal resistance here. Um, again, the question of rescue the reality is the story of colonial POWs is only just coming out. Um, and therefore I think that in terms of, of those who are involved in their rescue, those are, are going to be coming out soon, um, I hope. And that names, we can pick up names and start to, to get a bigger picture of, of networks. But again, this just requires um, just requires it requires a really close you know with going through the archives that we we've been through before but going over with them with an, a comb and teasing out the names and and places and people and organizations who are important to um who are important to this this new question um Raphael Sheik uh, he wrote a number of books in English uh, and Amel Mabon uh, uh, also, but hers are in French, but Rafael Shecky wrote about um, uh, Hitler's uh, um, African victims and which are a lot about the uh, prisoners, uh, colonial prisoners of war. And I think he is, you know, his book is a great place to start to look about um, for names of rescue and rescue is, is so important. And, and generally, I suppose, 
especially I think in France, the French, I interviewed a railway resistor who had given me, who on the same day that I interviewed him, he gave me, um, he gave me his resistance medal, which I was very moved by. Um, and he also asked me if he could be, if I could write a letter for him so that he could be a righteous amongst the nations because he had helped um, a Jewish family. And I found it very interesting and very telling that the story of resistance, that he, that he cared enough, but not enough about his resistance medal, but now he, he wanted to be recognized for his ask of rescue. And I think this is, a, this is a recent shift in our emphasis from resistance to rescue, which is still um, happening at the moment. So hopefully this idea of, um, this can kind of bring more names and people uh, to light. Thank you. And a question on a, a slightly um, different theme. Um, Simone is asking, is, is referring to the kind of uh, many and varied many and varied allegiances that French resistance groups had, which caused sometimes political and, and even military divisions. Um, was this these kinds of divisions were they reflected in colonial colonial resistor individuals or groups? I, I, I don't know the exact question, but I think that um, what is really important and uh, to look into is the, the, um, the, the, the communist resistors um, and looking, because there is a, a lot of information in the Paris archives. Um, and, and I think there, there's nothing in the interrogations that I have found. That's that points to that, but there will be undoubtedly tensions um, because they existed and we know that. And um, yeah, so I think understanding, and it's also, this is where I found uh, very quickly the most names of, of, of men and also women um, in, in the, who were linked to the FTP or link, linked to communist activities. Um, so I think understanding the importance of political allegiance in the, the the move towards resistance from from people from the colonies is is a really um, crucial one. Understand the communism and this spread of communism in the interwar period within the colonies because a lot of these links to the commu uh, communism are pre existing. Mm -hmm. um, I would imagine for someone like uh, like that for me that there would be tensions, especially with his later involvement in in Algeria, that there would be tensions with with um, more. Gaullist uh, uh, perspectives. Um, yeah, uh, but I have no way of knowing. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And then a question from Miss Moonlight about, um, well, just asking if you could talk a bit more about how colonial resistors situated themselves in relation to France and uh, the metropole during the occupation. I think very. My, my overarching answer would be less comfortably than before. I think that their experience in the occupation highlights a lot of what's been bubbling over in the interwar period of, um, of, of the, the relationship of these people, you know, the French state acknowledging and needing people from its empire but not recognizing them fully as citizens, not recognizing them fully as humans even. Um, this, the condition of the living conditions in the work camps is a really interesting lens to go through because the colonial laborers, they're not prisoners of war, um, but they are, um, they're not soldiers, but they are under so much strain in, um, in, in France, and they're, they've got, they have, there's work, colonial laborers are brought over from Indochina, um, they're brought over from North Africa, and they, their living conditions day to day are terrible. And they, you know, they are always, they are the, they comment repeatedly, they are the last to be given, uh, uh, brought to the hospital. They have, you know, and so the, some of the Marins, these godmothers, they're also there in, in the labor, and in, in the, and they're kind of forced work camps. They put on um, kind of maybe uh, festivals, religious festivals that that they might want to join in or try to you know have bring some music or some books that are um, would remind them of home. 
but crucially, they're cut off. They're completely cut off. They're not only cut off during the occupation, they're cut off for years. It takes an extraordinarily long time and they're in by no way the priority to, to, to take care of after the war. And it takes a very long time for them to return home um, to their country of origin. A lot of them leave, so many of them leave and they just prefer to be living in poverty, in, in, in Paris, you know, some, I actually came across postcards that sometimes they would send back to the, their friends who, had, who were still in the work camp saying, life is great, I'm in Paris. I don't think life was great, if I'm honest. But, um, and some of them actually joined, uh, also some of these uh, colonial laborers joined the, the Free French as, as they were liberating the Southern, Southern France, but then returned to the camps because they were, their conditions were so terrible in the Free French. Um, everyday life was a, a, a huge, huge struggle. So I think this, the relationship becomes very difficult and very bad and highlights huge tensions which erupt in a massive way after the war. Mm. And I suppose to develop on from that, Dan Stones asked whether, um, how, to what extent these uh, resistors um, when, might have gone on to fight against the French in the wars of decolonization. Uh, and this is likely a chance. Like that for me is a great example. Um, I, I feel t terrible because I have to yet again say, I don't know exactly um, uh, how many, but I think there is so much, um, there's already at the time there are protests and, and they are, you know, there's incidents which are happening in the, in the um, POW camps and in the work camps. Um, so I have no doubt that many of them would go and, and, and fight against France, although n not, not everyone. Um, some people retained a, a real allegiance to France. Um, but yeah, I yeah. think it's a really interesting link, uh, story to like the, the postscript of, of this period. Yes, definitely. And just, I think we've overrun slightly. There's one more question, if that's all right. And then I think um, <coughs> that we've asked, <laughs> we've interrogated you enough, but just a question from, um, from Alan asking whether faith um, played a, a role. Um, many of the, these resistors that you've talked about, um, or some of them anyway, would, would have been Muslims of North African origin. Did, did their faith play any kind of role in their motivation for resistance? Uh, I think so. There's actually a great article about um, uh, a, a mosque um, and acts of rescue and, and Muslims and rescue in, in Paris at the time. Um, and and I think faith um, faith va values religious values and and rescue can overlap a lot um, as well as with humanitarian values. Obviously, um, there is. I mean, I so yes, I think and and in a way, you know, the it's certainly in the case of 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 laborers. Um, they are organized. They are they are organized, literally organized according to where they come from, and hence they celebrate um, religious festivals together. Um, and so I think that would have um, a way of, of of being considered. But there's this by Ethan Katz. Um, he wrote about uh, Muslims in Paris and their role in in rescue. Um, and I think that'd be a really uh, interesting point to continue investigating. Okay, yes. Thank you so much. Just to say there's a few people who've, who've I think kind of asked for more details about your publications and things like that. So I think I'll um, just to say to pe people that I'll, I'll, um, I'll get um, some information about that on social media um, tomorrow. Um, so just remains me to um, thank you so much Ludovine for such an interesting talk and res responding to all of these um, questions as well. It's been a really great event. So we're really honoured that you were able to come and do this talk for us. It's been fantastic. Well, thank, thank you. you. That's okay. <laughs> thank you all very much for coming and for some great questions. I'm really sorry if I didn't get to your question. We had, uh, I think, um, more, much, you know, quite a lot of questions, more than normal. So I'm really sorry if I didn't get to you. Um, but yes, thank you all very much. And we hope to see you again um, very soon at another event or even in person at the library. So good night, everyone.